I'd like to start off by thanking the Programming Committee for inviting me to present what I hope will be an exciting line of research that we'll continue doing at Cincinnati Children's Hospital. So, um, you know, as the presentation indicates, we're really going to be looking at transition readiness in adolescents and young adults. Is this the forwarding button? Yes. Okay. Great. So I have nothing to disclose. So I will say that this research was really inspired by some of the clinical difficulties we were seeing transferring some of our older adolescent and young adult patients to the adult setting. That as well as what we were seeing in the research literature in that it seems that across many sites that there is a difficulty moving our patients forward. And I will say that part of that stems from these deficits that we're seeing in self-management. So there's some really great work that's come out of Boston that's really highlighted some of the deficits that we're seeing in our patients. For example, 55% uh, of 16 to 18 year olds lack important knowledge about their own medical history. Uh, less than half can accurately list their medications and dosings. And these are cr uh, critical pieces of information that when they move on to the adult care setting, we're really gonna need for them to know. And while um, some would say, well, that's just something that you need to deal with in the pediatric area, I would say that Transition is not just a pediatric problem. Yes, as pediatricians, we're really responsible for helping to prepare them, but ultimately, when they move on into the adult care setting, it's the adult GI doctors that are really bearing the responsibility for when transition or transfer doesn't happen in an optimal manner. So in response to some of the clinical difficulties we were seeing, a transition task force was for, uh, formed at Cincinnati Children's Hospital. And that included both providers from the adult and pediatric side, as well as administrators and patients as well. And they met for an eight month period to discuss some of the logistical barriers to transferring patients to the adult care setting, as well as establish some benchmarks to help us determine when is a patient really ready to move on to the adult care system. And based on that task force, a few, uh, task force, a few benchmarks were identified. Now, as you can see, some of them are very uh, medically based, such as disease activity. Some are more of whether the patient has a primary care physician. But for the purpose of today's presentation, I'm really going to focus on the top one, which is more of behavioral ac skill acquisition. So we wanted our patients to master 90% of transition readiness skills before they moved on into the adult care set setting. So the purpose of this study was really to see, now that we have these benchmarks, let's take a look at our patients and see how they're really doing. And based on that, are there specific gaps or deficits in their skill sets that we can begin targeting as part of our routine practice? So data for this study were collected across this from December to August 2013, and during that time, our social worker was meeting patients who were age 16 and up and having them fill out the transition readiness assessment questionnaire. For those of you who are unfamiliar with this measure, uh, the version 5.0 is actually a 20-item measure that lists a variety of skills that are essential for success in the adult health care system. So some of these may include taking your medicines correctly, filling prescriptions on your own, following up on lab tests and referrals, uh, as well as some basic uh, healthcare utilization knowledge, such as understanding what your health insurance covers. And I'll go into a few more of those measures down the road. As you can see uh, from our sample, we had primarily uh, patients who are around the age of 18, so they're already at the point where there are legally adults in the system. So to look at our first question of how many patients age 16 and up are actually meeting our benchmark of transition readiness, what you'll see here is that 5% of them are actually meeting our benchmark, which means that there's a 95% group of patients who are not meeting our benchmark. Some of you might argue that, well, you really you looked at 16-year-olds. They were included in the sample, and it would it be realistic to really expect a 16-year-old to really hit that benchmark? Well, let's break it down by age. When you look at patients who are below the age of 18, we have two out of 60 hitting the benchmark. But among those who are legally adults, we have about 7% that are hitting that benchmark. So clearly there are areas for improvement. You know, as we, we look at these results, we also wanted to see if there were any specific trends in our data. Are there certain groups of patients? Are there certain patient characteristics that would indicate that someone is more ready? 
So when we looked at age, we wanted to see, you can see here on the y-axis, it's the number of skills measured as uh, indicated by the track, and the x-axis is just by age. So we looked at the average number of skills mastered by age. And you can see here, I don't know if there's a mouse or a pointer. There was a pointer? Ah, there it is. Okay. So as you can see here, transition tends to increase, or readiness skills increases by age, but we're still falling short of that benchmark, which is 90% mastery. So if we were, let's say, to pretend to extend this trend line uh, to see at what point we would hit that benchmark, our patients would actually be 31 years of age before they hit that benchmark. How many of you would be willing to care for a patient up until the age of 31? <laughs> so very few, actually, and, and you know, by the time you're 31, you're dealing with a lot of adult issues that we may not be prepared to handle. But yes, up to age 31, that's when they actually hit that line, so somewhere around here. Now, anecdotally, we've actually had some of our parents come and talk to us and say, well, it's, it seems like it's harder to get my son to assume responsibility for some of these things. One of my parents told me recently, I can't even get him to call and order pizza by himself. I have to make that call for him. So we wanted to see if there really was a gender difference in transition skill acquisition. And when we look at that, we see that when we control for age, females are significantly further along the line in mastering those transition readiness skills than males. So on average, there are two scores or two skills ahead of males across the board. Now, whether this is due to biological differences in maturation, or it's due to how we as individuals uh, socialize raising boys versus girls, it's really unclear at this point, but there is a difference. So what we're hearing our, pa our parents tell us is actually true, that females seem to be further along than males. Finally, we wanted to see, based on these track data, what skills are patients really doing well at? And this table lists some of the skills that our patients tended to be on the upper end of the scale. So in general, when they come see you in the doctor's office, they are able to answer your questions and tell you how they're feeling. And in general, they can get to the medical appointment and they have some basic life skills such as utilizing local resources, but uh, what's interesting about this is that they say that they take their medications correctly and independently. And a lot of my background is actually in adherence research, and I can say that uh, in general our adolescents tend to overestimate the extent to which they actually take their medications, and that came up in one of the prior presentations, that adherence continues to be a problem, and they may be more confident or maybe a bit forgetful about the doses that they tend to miss. So these are the things that our patients are doing well. Let's take a look at some of the things that maybe they need a little bit of help with or areas for us to potentially target in our clinical care. So the first two things you'll see have to do with health insurance. What does my health insurance cover? How do I apply for health insurance? Now I will cut them a little bit of slack in saying that there are many adults who don't know what their health insurance covers. They can't figure out the health care system. And with upcoming changes as well, there's a lot more confusion around. But I think for our patients, it's especially critical for them to understand their health care plan because they will be the ones, they are going to be their best advocate. So they really need to know how to fight for themselves, how to stand for, up for themselves. There are other things that I, I found a bit surprising. So these, again, are at the low end of the scale, skills that our patients are not mastering. Calling the doctor's office to make an appointment, following up on referrals for labs, even filling a prescription picking up refills. These are the things that our patients are saying, no, I am not doing. Again, 16 to 25 year olds are basically telling us they cannot fill their prescriptions on time, they cannot pick up their medications. And my guess is that a lot of these items here and here are still being done by mom and dad. And our patients really haven't assumed, assumed responsibility for doing these tasks. And that really speaks to the importance of providing our families with guidance as to how to transition that responsibility from the parent to the child. You don't want to wait until the patient's transferred to the adult care setting and then all of a sudden give them several tasks that they've never had to do before on their own and now they have to do for the first time. That's basically setting them up for failure. So in conclusion, uh, very few patients are actually hitting our benchmark, which definitely indicates a great opportunity for us to start implementing interventions in our clinic. Females are generally doing better than males, but across the board we're seeing these core deficits in self-management, healthcare utilization, and self-advocacy. 
So in terms of what this means for you all and what you can do, we really need to start addressing these deficits in adolescence. You know, it's been said that adolescence is really the time in which lifelong health behaviors become established. So if we don't address these deficits in adolescence, they're going to carry on into adulthood and possibly lead to some irreversible, um, unfortunate consequences, both psychosocially and medically. The plus side of this is that all of the deficits that we're observing are modifiable behaviors. So we can definitely target these things with our patients. And by doing, you can do this in a very easy way. Implementing some sort of routine assessment to assess transition readiness skills is one way to identify those deficits because patients may not necessarily be aware of what they know and what they don't know. Now in our clinic, we're currently implementing paper and pet, uh, paper and pencil measures, but we're slowly moving towards putting the track on a tablet so that our patients can fill it out in the waiting room, and then that information will be uploaded into Epic for the clinician to see as soon as they open up the medical record. And then finally, as I mentioned earlier, we need to provide our patients and our parents with guidance. And there's a really great checklist that was put out by NASP again several years ago that we can use, that we can show our families to teach them what skills they should try to transition over time to their uh, adolescent patient. So in terms of future directions of this research, this is actually the beginning of a newly funded CCFA Career Development Award that I will be working on. So we are about three months into the study, so we've clearly made a lot of progress in those three months. And we're working towards uh, developing a transition to adult care program that's really focused on addressing those self-management deficits. It's a three-phase approach to program development, and our first phase is really looking at a needs assessment, conducting focus group inter interviews with patients and uh, their parents, both on the pediatric and the adult side, as well as pediatricians and adult GI doctors. So we're currently in the middle of that phase. We are implementing objective outcomes assessment that we're using with our transition benchmarks, and a key feature of this project is really high levels of patient, parent, and provider engagement. So they're involved from the very beginning, and they'll, they'll basically be working with us through the end of the project. So in closing, I'd like to acknowledge a lot of the collaborators in the grant, and then also say that in order for our patients to make the leap from pediatric to adult care, we really need to provide them with support, routine assessment, and guidance. And this isn't something that we start doing just as they're transferring to adult care. But we really need to start from the very beginning and continue that on until they reach the adult health care system. So we need to provide that support throughout. So I'd like to open it up for any questions or comments. I'm sorry, I, we have no time for questions. Okay. Because you ran over a sorry. little bit. Okay, right. Thank you.